On this Saturday night, a hockey legend's tribute to his dad. Walter Gretzky is remembered as the captain of a family. He has a heart of gold and just wonderful. <laughs> a Canadian treasure laid to rest. Vaccination acceleration. The proposal to give shots 24-7 in Canada's largest city. 100 days, the farmers' protest in India and the political implications for Canada. Plus, the sweet success story. Peace is the noblest value on earth that everyone should fight for. From Syrian refugee to Canadian entrepreneur. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A small funeral was held in Brantford, Ontario to honour one of Canada's proudest hockey dads. Walter Gretzky, the father of Canadian hockey legend Wayne Gretzky, was laid to rest in his hometown. The older Gretzky was fiercely dedicated to the game and guided a rising star from their backyard rink to the Hockey Hall of Fame. As Mike LeCouture reports, the great one had to say goodbye to his biggest fan. With jerseys on their backs and sticks in their hands, families lined the street across from St. Mark's Anglican Church in Brantford, Ontario to pay their final respects to the man who was considered Canada's hockey dad. It's just a really sad time for the community with everything he's done. You know, uh, go to the grocery store, see Walter, go to McDonald's. He was just an everyday regular guy. The location and the service were humble, just like the man himself. The most famous hockey dad was eulogized by his even more famous son. We thought weeks ago that the end was here. Wayne Gretzky said his father's hip injury in February was difficult for the entire family, but they spent the last 21 days telling stories. He shared some of them with the few people who were allowed inside the church due to the pandemic. I don't think I've ever met a prouder Canadian than my dad. Gretzky spoke about Walter's love of this country, of hockey, but mostly his love of helping children. Something that was evident from how much of his own time he spent volunteering for a number of charities. He was a remarkable man who loved life, loved family. We'd be a way better world if there were so many more people like my dad. Outside the Wayne Gretzky Sports Centre in Brantford, flowers and hockey sticks were piling up by the statue honouring Walter, his wife and Wayne. The arena and monument are a testament to the family's mark on the community, but it's the memories of Walter's daily interactions with people that many hold so dear. We had uh, it was hometown hockey here. Most of the stars were inside the arena. Walter sat here outside in the cold, nose was dripping and signing autographs like it wasn't cold. In the back of the, my mind, I, I, I think about how good of a dad he was and how good of a dad I want to be. Amazing grace. The words of so many giving comfort to the family as they mourn the loss of such an icon of the city, the country, and the game of hockey. I'm so proud of the fact that so many people have reached out and given him such great tributes because he deserves it. He has the heart of gold and just wonderful. <laughs> Mike LeCouture, Global News. To the fight against COVID-19 now. The provinces are preparing to expand their vaccination campaigns with more doses becoming available. In Canada's largest city, politicians are calling for a 24-7 operation to get as many people vaccinated as soon as possible. It would be a huge shift. Global's Catherine Ward looks into the infrastructure needed to get this strategy going. With every administered dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, Canada inches closer towards life post-pandemic. I'll take it any time of the day. People would want to take it however time they could take it because people want to get out and do stuff with their lives. As supply increases, more people become eligible. Doctors know timing is everything. It's very clear that we need to get this done as rapidly as possible. And when it comes to timing, the City of Toronto will consider a motion at Council this week for vaccine clinics to run 24-7. Councillor Shelley Carroll says people want more details. This motion is about tell them what the future looks like. We're all going to get vaccinated. However, the chair of Toronto's Board of Health says round-the-clock clinics have always been part of the city's strategy. Toronto has developed an immunization model that can be scaled at any time based on supply. 
And so if we have enough supply to run 24 hours and get them out faster, that's exactly what we're ready to do. Experts say the location of the clinics also plays a key role to ensure as many people as possible choose to get vaccinated. We know we have people um, who are shift workers, for example, uh, or, who, or who can't get, take time off work during a bit traditional business hours. And so they need to be able to have uh, access all through the day and night. Should the 24-hour clinic model be replicated in other parts of the province, family physicians say they are ready and willing to help. Many family doctors have signed up for these mass vaccine clinics that are going to open, and they're ready to, at the ready for the moment when they open. If we added shifts that were going to be overnight, I know my colleagues across the province would be prepared to step up. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. The federal government is under mounting pressure to address accusations of sexual misconduct in the military. The defense minister in particular is facing intense scrutiny over the handling of allegations of inappropriate behavior by former chief of the defense staff, General Jonathan Vance. This week on the West Block, Mercedes Stevenson speaks with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh about whether he still has confidence in the defense minister. Mercedes? Robin, last week the former military ombudsman said that he tried to present the defense minister, Harjit Sajjan, with proof of sexual misconduct allegations against former chief of the defense staff, General Jonathan Vance, but that Sajjan refused to look at the evidence. I asked NDP leader Jagmeet Singh if he thought the defense minister should have told the prime minister about concerns the ombudsman had raised with him. There's no way something as astounding and as, as serious as that, that testimony was, was just shocking, that evidence was brought forward and presented and, and there seemed to be an unwillingness to do anything with it. Uh, so far from what we know, it looks like there was this case of the hot potato. No one wanted to look at the evidence when that's what everyone should be doing, trying to get to the bottom of this, making sure that people are safe, making sure allegations are pursued or investigated. Singh would not say if he believes Sajjan should step down. The chair of the House of Commons Defence Committee, Liberal MP Karen McCribbin, a military veteran herself, says there is nothing more that Sajjan could have done because the ombudsman brought him, quote, confidential and unactionable information. I asked the committee chair how the minister could evaluate that evidence when the ombudsman says he would not look at it. Here is her response. He sent, it to, he sent it to the PCO and said to the PCO, you go and do a look at this evidence. Tell me if it's what, if there's something here I can do. But the Privy Council office, which is uh, an independent, non-political, outside the chain of command organization who do this all the time, it's their job to do this for governor and council appointments. Following concerns about the military investigating itself and calls for a more robust external oversight process, the Prime Minister said on Friday that the government is looking up setting up a, quote, more independent process to investigate allegations of sexual misconduct in the military. But there are no details so far on exactly what that process or those changes might look like. Robin? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thanks, Mercedes. Global News has obtained documents about an early warning from the Privy Council office related to the Vance case back in 2018. You can read it at globalnews.ca slash globalnational. In India, thousands of farmers blocked a major highway to mark the 100th day of protest against new agricultural laws. <laughs> They used tractors and their own bodies to stop traffic just outside New Delhi for five hours. For more than three months, tens of thousands of farmers have been demanding the controversial laws be repealed. They say the new rules will hurt them by opening up the agriculture sector to private players. But India's government says the laws are much needed reforms to modernize the country's agriculture industry. The ongoing tensions in India have ramifications in Canada for the large population of Indo-Canadians living in this country and for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who's had a rocky relationship with India's Prime Minister. Abigail Beeman reports. For months, tens of thousands of farmers have taken to the streets in India. Protests have at times been violent. More than 200 farmers have died. They began after the government introduced three new laws aimed at liberalizing trade. Protesters, largely Sikh, are worried about their livelihood. What will happen to government-controlled markets and minimum price guarantees? Those aren't mentioned in the new laws. 
to take away parts of that safety net in the absence of other formal safety nets and insurance mechanisms, I think is deeply flawed. It's really disheartening and hard to watch being here, but the most, the most inspiring act is them staying where they are. And they have said they're not leaving. Indo-Canadians have been protesting daily too. This is about both the safety of the farmers as well as repealing the laws. They're both equally important. The Prime Minister has voiced his support for the farmers. We've reached out uh, through multiple means directly to uh, the Indian authorities uh, to highlight our concerns. The Narendra Modi government, with which Canada has had rocky relations, isn't taking kindly to that. It sent a new note expressing concerns, asking Canada to investigate. We have come across reports of threats and intimidation to some members of the Indian community in Can Canada. With a large Sikh population in Canada, some feel Canadians don't have the full story. There are Indian farmers who aren't against the new laws. I am from Chhattisgarh. We don't have even a single protest out there. And some in Canada feel protests here have moved away from farm issues. There is a religious divide between Hindus and Sikhs, which is, this should not happen. This thing should stop, you know, we want peace. Sikh Canadians are a very important a source of votes. They are concentrated in seat-rich areas in Greater Toronto and Vancouver. So it's really all about domestic politics. Very little, to be honest, to do with what's going on back, back in India. But what all this means for Canadian farmers and exporters isn't clear. So in the short run, uh, we don't know. And that's terrible for Canadian exporters because uncertainty is always terrible for trade. Economist Raji Jayaraman says if the laws come into force, it could mean good news in the longer term, with more room for exporters to enter a huge market. <laughs> but amid unrest and uncertainty, nothing's clear. For now, the laws have been suspended under review by India's Supreme Court. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. India claims Myanmar is asking for the return of eight police officers who have sought refuge across the border to avoid taking orders from the military. Security forces again carried out violent nighttime raids in the country also known as Burma. The military is on a mission to crack down on protesters who are demanding a return of the democratically elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. The UN Special Envoy warns hopes for the Security Council to take swift action is waning fast. At least 54 people were killed during demonstrations this week. At least 20 people are dead after a suicide car bombing in Somalia. The vehicle, packed with explosives, rammed into a popular restaurant in the country's capital. The powerful blast caused several nearby homes to collapse. Dozens of people were injured. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack, but police blame the local Al-Shabaab extremist group. Pope Francis met with Iraq's top Shiite cleric today during his historic visit to the country. The 40-minute meeting in Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani's home was years in the making. Every detail was negotiated by the Ayatollah's office and the Vatican. The two delivered a powerful message of peaceful coexistence, urging Muslims in Iraq to embrace the Christian minority. The dwindling Christian community has faced violence and persecution for decades. The Pope later visited Ur, the ancient birthplace of Abraham, the biblical figure revered by Christians, Jews and Muslims. Coming up, police under scrutiny after a woman is pepper sprayed with her toddler. And a witness account of the day Tiger Woods rolled his SUV. A Rochester, New York police officer has been placed on administrative duty. He's accused of using pepper spray on a woman suspected of shoplifting while she was holding her three-year-old child. This incident has troubling parallels to two other cases involving the police department. Jennifer Johnson reports, and a warning, this story may be disturbing for some viewers. I did not do anything. The Rochester police body cam video horrified many local residents. Police confronted a woman holding her three-year-old daughter, suspecting her of shoplifting. The video appears to show the woman trying to prove she didn't take anything. The woman tries to flee. Police wrestle her to the ground. Her child is heard screaming. At one point, an officer pepper sprays the woman. They handcuff her and take the child away. Bystanders watched in disgust. It don't make a difference if it's a black, blue, purple, gray person. 
is inhumane. I, I got her. The incident comes after Rochester police used pepper spray on a nine-year-old girl in handcuffs during a family dispute call. Burn my eyes. The board that oversees the department says it has to do better. The officer has now been taken off the streets pending an investigation. What we would like to see is the handling of things being handled in a way that shows sensitivity. The incidents come while the department is still investigating officers involved in the arrest and death of 41-year-old Daniel Prude. Prude was naked and unarmed when officers pinned him to the pavement for two minutes. He died seven days later. An autopsy showed he had been under the influence of PCP. A grand jury declined to indict the officers, but the city's police chief is promising reform. How can we best come to a resolution with the least amount of confrontation? The woman in this video was eventually charged with trespassing for staying in a store after being told to leave. But some members of the accountability board say the officers should have backed off after finding no stolen items. It was the officer's action from then on that escalated the situation. City residents voted overwhelmingly in 2019 to create the Police Accountability Board to investigate allegations of police misconduct after years of clashing with law enforcement. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Still ahead, Sydney's cricket ground swells with pride. You're watching Global National. It's got a blown engine. Oh, no! A report has found the engine on a United Airlines flight failed when pilots throttled up to minimize turbulence. The National Transportation Safety Board also revealed a fan blade that broke, was inspected for wear and tear in 2016, and was less than halfway to the point of needing another look. Last month, Flight 328 made an emergency landing in Denver shortly after takeoff. Part of the plane ended up in a residential neighborhood. Incredibly, no one was hurt. According to a witness, Tiger Woods was found unconscious after crashing his SUV in California last month. Court documents reveal a man who lives close by heard the crash and walked to the scene. He found the champion golfer with his face and chin covered in blood and unable to respond to questions. The crash left the 45-year-old with serious injuries. He shattered his ankle and suffered multiple open fractures to his lower right leg. Police say there's no evidence drugs or alcohol played a part. Up next, from Syria to Canada, the entrepreneur selling peace. Pride has filled the pitch of Sydney's famous cricket ground. The 43rd annual Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Parade is taking place in the stadium for the first time. The seats were capped at 75% capacity, so about 36,000 people attended. Usually 10 times that amount lined the streets for the event. But there are smaller crowds this time around because of COVID restrictions. Two weeks ago, Australia began its vaccination campaign. There are currently 56 active cases in the state of New South Wales. Setting up shop during a pandemic may seem like a risky business, but a Nova Scotia family has been through worse. In 2015, they arrived in Canada as refugees from Syria. Now, Canadian citizens, they're expanding a family business in Nova Scotia. Ross Lord has this sweet success story. <laughs> a mask hides his smile, but Tara Kadad's eyes still sparkle. Despite a depressed economy from the pandemic, the man who fled Syria with his family is expanding his Peace by Chocolate brand with a new shop in Halifax. We wanted to translate our culture and our heritage into something so beautiful. So when you look in the arch, the turquoise that translates into the color in our ancient Syrian houses in Damascus, the peace signs, you know, the portrait, the, the peace wall behind me. The portrait is of Haddad's father, Issam Adin. He runs the family's chocolate factory in the town of Antigonish, Nova Scotia, where they settled after coming to Canada in 2015. Soon after he was sworn in as a Canadian citizen last year, the pandemic hit. Hadez says it's been stressful for his family, but he says they have a different perspective than many Canadians. He says a bomb destroyed their original chocolate factory in Damascus in 2012. Nothing compares to living in your house in downtown Damascus at that time. 
and just waiting for uh, an airstrike, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's really straight. It's been really stressful for our family during the war, but when we, the pandemic came, we were like, we are staying home, but we are staying safe in our homes. Investing in a new shop when many businesses are barely hanging on is another testament to a perfect marriage, the idea of peace and the taste of chocolate. Peace is the noblest value on earth that everyone should fight for. And chocolate is a product of happiness. Chocolate makes happiness, right? So far, so good. Within two hours on opening day, more than 100 customers had arrived. He's charming, he's charismatic, he understands what he's doing, he creates a beautiful product and he brings the community in and brings us together. Now that he's added new flavors, Haddad plans to install a patio in time for summer. And he's working to expand export networks, completing the journey from hardship to harmony. Ross Lord, Global News. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is Monticello on Prince Edward Island. We would love to see your corner of the country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.